Well, welcome everybody to Gainesville Church. Would you all stand? We're going to sing and praise Jesus. We're going to sing his name. Here we go. See this together, church. When all I see. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am saved with you. So when I fight, so when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. For me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see of the ashes, you see the gloom. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. And nothing can stand against the power of our God. And almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Oh, you shine in the Shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Oh, and Almighty Fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in.
sing this together, church. Miracles. Oh, miracles when you move. Such an easy thing for you to do. And your hand is moving right now. You are still showing up at the tomb of every Lazarus. And your voice is calling me out. And right now, I know you're able. My God, you come through again. You can do all things. You can do all things but fail. Cause you never lost a battle. No, you never lost a battle, and I know, I know, you never will. Oh, and everything's possible by the power of the Holy Ghost. And you win, is blowing right now. Breaking my heart of stone, taking over like it's Jericho. pray with me this morning, church. Lord Jesus, we celebrate in our lives that you never lose. Whatever the circumstances, whatever the hurt, whatever the pain is, we know you will come through for us. Even when we don't understand it, even when we don't see it, you are there walking beside us, Lord God. So we celebrate that this morning. We thank you for this service, Lord God. We pray you would work miracles in our hearts this morning. Have your spirit change us in ways we couldn't even believe to happen, Lord. So we thank you. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated, church. Amen. Good morning, church. My name is Benson McGlone. I'm one of the pastors here. And this morning, I have the awesome privilege of being one of the Sunday school teachers here. So this is our fifth through third grade Sunday school. Parents, sorry you didn't know this was happening. Uh, and they are going to help me with announcements and public speaking. Some people aren't into, some people are capable of it. And so here's what you are going to do after the announcements as we are leaving. You are going to give them all a round of applause because we are going to encourage them in that way. But here we go, announcements. Our angel tree is up. We're supporting 75 kids. 
You can sign up in the lobby. Presents will be back by December 4th. Exactly. There, there were lots of service people in the church that make everything possible. Sign up for a group in the fellowship hall after service. Cushy was Santa, December 10th. Nailed it. Harrison. It is a big event. Sign up online. You better sign up. Those are the announcements. I hope you got them all. They were on the screen. We're out. Let's go! Yeah! Before Pastor John comes up and gives us the sermon, would you all bow your heads and pray for the sermon with me? Lord God, we thank you for Pastor John and all his sacrifices for this church. We pray your spirit would work through his heart this morning to make his words be your words and that your words would change us for the better. That as we learn more about our family of this church, that we would recognize all the good things you do in here day in and day out. So help John to lead us this morning. We thank you for this, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. I like the way Adam prays. Folks, I'm going to ask you to do something that I will never ask you to do again, but I want you to do it with me. Because of Facebook, because of the algorithms they use, I can't have the introduction to the message that I want. So everybody, if you will take out your phone. Come on, take it out. Take it out. Pick it up. YouTube. Go to YouTube. Now, you have to hold up your ear. Don't put it on speaker. It might get picked up by the microphones, and then we'd be in trouble with Facebook. Go to YouTube, Sister Sledge. We are family. Okay, everybody, you got it? When you get there, you start to hear the music. Put it up to your ear. Yeah, you, you're going to have to go through one YouTube ad, but you can skip the ad after five seconds. Can I subscribe under your email address? Yes, absolutely. Go for it, because on Wednesday it goes away. Wait till you get to do the introduction. It's a 30-second introduction. Somebody's there. There we go. Okay, shut them down. You know what it's about then. The message this morning is we are family. Gainesville Church, we are family. I love my church because we are family. Listen to the word of God this morning from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Therefore, I've told you this many a time before, I've told Bible studies this, whenever Paul puts therefore, what follows is very important. If Paul writes therefore, it's important. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bear with one another, and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. We all have families, don't we? Sometimes they get along. Sometimes, not so much. Most families have that peculiar relative. You know the one. Comes to family reunions, dressed in bib overalls with no shirt. Tells you about the boat he's going to buy, or the big vacation he's taking to Cancun. Some families embrace that peculiar relative, and the family stays together and actually grows stronger because they enjoy his peculiarity. They laugh and they joke and they have fun. But then some families, they get tired of this peculiar relative. They become frustrated and even angry. And those families often don't stay together. 
when we learn to be with one another even in the midst of our peculiarities, even in the midst of our weirdness, we can grow together as a family. The best families have one thing in common. They learn to forgive graciously. They learn to forgive graciously, and they learn to forgive again and again and again and again. They don't stop forgiving. I knew one family one time, between the parents, the husband and wife, they had one sibling. The father had a sister. The mother had no siblings. But that sibling or that sibling's spouse did something way in the past, and the family was disintegrated. The relationship was exiled. Weddings came, they weren't invited. Funerals came, they weren't invited. The family was destroyed because one person did something that the other persons thought was unforgivable. I never did learn what that spouse or that person did, but that family relationship ended. Successful families learn to do what Jesus taught us to do. Remember the story about Peter coming to Jesus and he says, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? Peter thought he was being really generous because the rabbis of that day taught that if you forgave three times, that satisfied the law. Peter doubled that. No, he more than doubled that. He said, I'll forgive seven times. And Jesus said, no, Peter, I want you to forgive 70 times seven. And Jesus didn't even mean 490 times. What he meant was to forgive an unlimited amount. That's the way he wants us to forgive, and that's what builds strong families. Great families are forgiving families, not just to a certain point. You know, where that one family I talked about, they forgave up to a point, but once they crossed that line, no more forgiveness. No, families that are great families, families that are godly families, they forgive again. They don't stop forgiving. You know how you can learn to forgive? I'll tell you a real simple trick. I use this in all my premarital counseling. Look for the good in your spouse. Because truth be told, you find what you're looking for. If you are always looking for and pointing out their faults and their flaws and their mistakes, that's what you will focus on, and you will find it very difficult to forgive. But if you're looking for their good points, their qualities, and you're celebrating those, you'll find it much, much easier to forgive their mistakes. It works with spouses. It also works with families. Learn to look for the good things in those people in your family, because you will always find what you're looking for. And oh, by the way, you know what gets repeated? Things that are celebrated. When you celebrate something, when you celebrate their good things, those things get repeated. But if you are constantly harping on their faults and their flaws and their mistakes, guess what? Those two are going to be repeated. I love my church, folks. I love my church because we are family. I like that song especially because it does say that, but it was also a special time in my life. It was 1979. It was the year that the Steelers won their fourth Super Bowl. It was also the year when the Pirates won the, Super, uh, won the World Series. And I did the most uber fan thing I've ever done. I got in my car and I drove an hour and a half to the uh, Pittsburgh International Airport and my buddy and I, we greeted the team as they got off the plane. So I love that song for a variety of reasons, but I love it because it states a truth about what a church should be, what a church can be. We are family. We have people from all different walks of life. We have people who are professionals and white collar workers. We have people who are blue collar workers. We have business owners. We have people who haven't worked for years. They're retired, but we're all family. We have people from around the world in this church. Did you know that? We have people, I think, from four or five of the continents of the world that attend this church. We have people in this church, and I love that. 
I love that about Gainesville Church. We also have people in this church who are just starting out in life, and we have people who have been retired for decades. We have people on the left of the political spectrum. We have people on the right. We have people who are a little weird. No, I take that back. All of us are a little weird. And the sooner we recognize that about ourselves, the more we'll be family. We have one lady, I wish she were here. She loaned me my costume for the trunk retreat, thing one and thing two. This one woman who leads the music for VBS, she's really weird and in a great way. She makes the kids love Vacation Bible School because of her costumes, because of her weirdness, because of just the joy that she brings. We're family. And what will keep this family together in the midst of all the turmoil in this world is to be a compassionate people. Compassion is an undervalued commodity in our world. Can you think of any place where you would want to be more than a place where people were compassionate to you? That when you tripped, when you fought, fell, when you made a mistake, they were compassionate. Our world out there is not very compassionate. Our world is also not patient, but Paul tells us patience is another quality that a good family has. Patience is not, is a lost commodity in our world out there. Do you know what the definition of a split second is? From the time the light turns red to green till the guy hits his horn behind you. That's a split second. Our world isn't a patient place. But we are family, and we need to be patient with each other. We need that because we are family. Kindness. Kindness marks a good family. When people are kind to one another, and it's often an unvalued commodity. Too often we value things like the accomplishments of a person, how driven they are, their wealth, their fame. They're the funniest person in the room. We don't value the fact that the person who is always kind holds things together. A person who is genuinely kind in a family to all the family members helps hold that family together. You can have the most successful, the most driven, the most accomplished people in your family, but if they're unkind to one another, the family will fall apart. It's the same thing in a church. We are family and kindness is such an important quality that we need to possess. Gentleness. Gentleness in our world is viewed as a weakness. Many of you are too young to remember that old, old musical from the 60s, Camelot. Well, in that musical, one of the characters sang a song about the seven deadly virtues, and he said, it's not the earth the meek inherit, it's the dirt. That if you're meek, if you're gentle, then you're going to get trampled down. Gentle people, I think, true gentleness. It's not a weakness. It's a strength. People who are truly gentle can still say truth, can still stand against evil, can still be a rock. But they do it in a gentle way. Gentleness holds families together. Aggressiveness. You get a bunch of aggressive people in a family together for a Thanksgiving dinner, and they have differing opinions on everything, especially politics, how long do you think that party's going to last? Gentleness is a quality of the church family. Good families are also people who have humility. You see, the way you gain humility it's not always looking down at the ground and saying, I'm sorry, that's okay, I didn't mean it. No. Humility comes from a good EQ. Everybody know what EQ is? Emotional intelligence. When I have an understanding of myself, a really clear and good and accurate understanding of myself, I understand I'm broken. I understand I'm flawed. I understand I have foibles. And you know what that does for me? That allows me to be humble, but it also allows me to forgive, and even forgive like Christ forgave us, because I understand my own need for forgiveness. If I have a low EQ, 
And I think I have far fewer faults, far fewer flaws than I really do. And I tend to be an unforgiving person. Understanding who I am and my flaws and my faults and my failings can make me a very understanding, compassionate, patient, gentle, and forgiving person. You know, as I was thinking about this message, I thought of something that I have just wanted to say in the church for a while, but couldn't find a good place to put it. I think here's the place. Anybody hear of Pascal's Wager? Pascal's Wager? Blaise Pascal was a 17th century French mathematician, philosopher, physicist, and theologian. He posited or postulated this. Either God exists or he doesn't. And every human being who walks the earth wagers with their very life on whether God exists or God doesn't. God is or God is not. Reason can't decide this for you. But a game is being played, the flipping of a coin. Either heads will turn up or tails will. And guess what? You've got to wager. It's not optional. You've got to wager whether God is or God isn't. If you wager God is, and you're right, then you gain everything. If you're wrong and God doesn't exist, then you really lost nothing. But if you wager God doesn't exist and you're wrong, then you've lost everything and you've lost it for eternity. That's Pascal's wager. I think it's rather clever. I differ with Pascal on just one point. I say that if God doesn't exist and you wager that he does and you live your life according to scripture, you live your life trying to emulate Jesus Christ, following his commands, if you try to do what Paul was outlining here in Colossians, show compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, and above all else, love, I say you win. You win big. Because to live a life like that, even if God doesn't exist, you live a better life, a much better life. If you live according to the words of Jesus, according to the words that come to us from Paul, and you live with these kinds of qualities in your life, you win big. 1989, there was a book that was written. Notice how many of my references are old. I must be getting old. Actually, I was thinking about this. I was watching a rerun of the original Godfather. And toward the end of the movie, if you remember the movie, there's a scene where Don Corleone is just kind of putzing around the office. Michael is seated in his chair. And all the underbosses have come to him and they go, so, Godfather, what should we do about this? What should we do about that? And he says, Michael is now in charge of the family business. I have every confidence in him. Go ask Michael. And as I sat and I watched that scene, I thought, this is my transition that I'm living right now. I'm in the office. I'm putzing around. But Benson's now in charge of the family church. Go ask Benson. I have every confidence in him. I just thought of that. It's just one of those weird things because as someone once said, I said it, and someone said they liked it, my brain is filled with eclectic trash, and it just kind of flows out sometimes. But in 1989, Stephen Covey wrote a book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. One of them was to begin with the end in mind. In other words, what do you want people to say about you and think about you at your own funeral? I want to tell you something. This is an absolute truth, at least in my life. I've never met a 20-something who said, when I get old, I want to be mean, I want to be crotchety, I want to be cantankerous, I want to be judgmental, and I want to be an intolerant person. Never met that person. I think I could live to be 150 and I'd never meet a 20-something who said that when I get toward the end of my life, I'd like to be that mean, crotchety, cantankerous, impatient, intolerant, judgmental person. And I've never met, by the way, somebody who was older, maybe in their 70s or 80s, said, you know what? When I'm mean, crotchety, cantankerous, judgmental, and intolerant, I'm at my happiest. I just love life when I'm like that. 
No, I meet people who are like this, and you know what? They're the most unhappy people in the world. They've let life build into them meanness, cantankerousness, judgment, intolerance. They've lost the compassion, the kindness, the humility, the gentleness, the patience, the forgiveness, and the love that God should be pouring into our lives on a daily basis. And the excuse that they make, well, I'm old. That's just the way I am. I've said this to you before, I'll say it again. God does not stop transforming lives at 65 or 70 or 75 or 80 or 90 or 100. God transforms people's lives who want to be transformed by his power of his spirit until the day we die or until the day we stop trying. What God is calling us to be through the Apostle Paul not only will make a strong home family, but it makes a strong church family. And you know what? When we live like that, we are living our happiest life. Not only do we win everything because God is, but we win everything on earth because we're living the way that God has called us to live. We find our joy in this world by being filled with compassion, kindness, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, and love. We find the joy that we're seeking. I love this church because this is a family. We are family. We come from a lot of different backgrounds. I love that about this church. We have people from, I think, four of the five continents of the world. I have people here, I'm sure, that can trace their roots back to Plymouth Rock, where the Mayflower landed back in the 17th century. We're going to celebrate Thanksgiving, which we kind of trace back to that Mayflower thing. I'm sure there are people in here that are descendants of Patrick Henry. You know, the guy who said, give me liberty or give me death? Well, Patrick Henry, the reason why I can say I'm sure of that, he had 64 natural grandchildren. You think about that family tree from then to now. That is a big family tree. We also have people here in this church for whom English is a second language. Until I married Dolly, and I didn't realize what a challenge that was. To be and live in a land where the language that you think in is not the language that's spoken. You have to translate things from your language to that. It's difficult. We have a number of people in this church for whom English is a second language. I remember a person from back in my days at Fairfax United Methodist Church who was from Cuba. He was a Cuban exile. He came to this country at 18 when he was in 1960. By the time I met him in 1988, he spoke what I would consider fluent English. But he told me one time, he said, John, I didn't really know the language until one night I dreamed in English, not in Spanish. Kind of hit me. That's a challenge. You dream and you're speaking Spanish and everybody in your dream is speaking Spanish. Because English is your second language. But we have people here where language doesn't divide us because we are family. We're family here. We have people who only vote Democrat in this church. We have people who only vote Republican in this church. We have people who are independent and will never say that I subscribe to one party or the other. But we will not let politics divide us because we are family. We have people with varying opinions on things like abortion, gun rights, LGBTQ, same-sex marriage, and a variety of other issues. But we won't allow the differences of opinion to divide us because we are family. Because we strive to love each other as Christ loved us. And when we fail and when we fall and when we make mistakes, we forgive one another as Christ forgave us. Because we our family. We choose to be family, not just when it's convenient, not just when it's easy, but we choose family over everything else. Because this family is that important. We choose to be family. I told you I love this song that you all listen to on your phone because of the 1979 Pirates. But if you were in Pittsburgh in those days, and I was, they weren't supposed to win anything. 
Willie Stargell could barely go from playing in the infield and get back to first base to catch a ball on a grounder because his knees were so bad. And yet Willie Stargell, I think, was leading at some point the National League in home runs. And they played Sister Sledge every day in the locker room. And as the season continued, as they continued to get better, Manny Sanguin was the catcher and he was old. I have a baseball with his autograph in my office, by the way. Just thought I'd mention that. They played it louder and louder until they won their division and just blared, blared at the locker room. We are family. The radio stations played it incessantly. We are family. And then when they won the National League uh, pennant, it came on even more. Everybody in Pittsburgh was singing, we are family. It was a powerful time, a powerful message. I'm telling you folks, as much as that was exciting to me to be a Pittsburgher in those days, the we are family about church is more powerful, more exciting, and more real. Look around. Right now, do it. Look around. Behind you. Side. Other side. It's your family, folks. We are family. Like any family, we'll have our tough times. We'll have our great times, too. In fact, as you've heard Benson and myself say, no matter how good the past has been, the best is yet to come. And we're going to do it together as a family. Family. We are family. The family of God. We'll be a family for eternity. Do you know that? For eternity. You looked around, there's your family. You're going to find out how important they are when you meet them again in heaven. And you'll realize, that's my sister. That's my brother. I've missed them. We are family. Amen. Now we have Sam McKeon, who is going to give us his stewardship testimony. It's something that our board members have been doing. You've, I think we've been doing it for five or six months. And Sam is up for the month of November. And Sam, we're family. I turn it over to you. God be, and God be the glory and God bless you. Thank you. Amen. As Pastor John stated, I am Sam McCown. A uh, husband of Juanita McCown, uh, one of your board members here at Gainesville United Methodist Church. Um, in a couple of days, we will celebrate our National Day of Thanksgiving. And with great pleasure, I thank God for you and your worship of giving. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God is my provider, which demands godly stewardship. His covenant love is sufficient, so I am able to grow. Grow. Give. I am able to give because he gives without restraint to me. That makes me a ready giver. Reach. I look for new places to give, and when possible, I get in on the giving. Optimize. To optimize normally is to reach a full state of operation. Well, wouldn't you know it, our God's economy, he doesn't stop at normal. He blesses me to press into becoming generous. Worship. In the life of him who provides stewardship is a discipline that must be honed and continuously used with an expectation to be a blessing. Yes, God empowers me to grow in my stewardship. My testimony of stewardship 
by the grace of God, my provider, because he is. And meditate with me, if you will. God is good and God is great. God is my resource. Nothing I give is not first given to me by God. Oh, Lord, forever. Thank you. Giving, allowing me new avenues to become generous. Worthy is the Lord. Be all praise and glory who blesses and makes us vessels of blessings through our giving and generosity. Thank you. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen. I'd like you to think about something as we go to our time of prayer. Change is always a scary thing, isn't it? It shouldn't be for the Christian. We face an unknown future with a known God. We face an unknown future with the known God at our side. It's been a sign, uh, a, several months of change for my wife and myself. I did something a, last week sometime that I've never done in my life. I've never rented anything. I was in dorm rooms. I was in a efficiency in seminary for a little while. I graduated from seminary, I lived in a parsonage, then I lived in another parsonage, then I lived in another parsonage, then I lived in another parsonage, and another parsonage after that. Then we bought a house, and then another house. For 22 years, I was in the same house. It took one and a half dumpsters to throw away the junk that was accumulated in those 22 years, stuck in full-size dumpsters. But this has been a time of change. But if we face change, the unknown future, relying on the known God that we serve, we will not only get through that change, but we'll get through that change with joy and with compassion and with love and with kindness and gentleness and patience. We can conquer change by staying close to that known God. Let's bow our heads. Let's ask God. Help us stay close to him in whatever season of life we're in. Lord God, change occurs all the time. There will be change here in our church. There will be change in our homes. There will be change in almost every aspect of our lives. But Lord, rather than fearing change, rather than being afraid of that change, Lord, make us more than conquerors in you. For you have a plan for our lives in the midst of change. You have a plan in life, a plan for us, no matter what season of life we may be in. You don't stop calling us to be your hands and feet when we get to be a certain age. You call us. You call us to go into the world and make disciples. One more, Lord. One more. Whatever season of life each person here is, is in here today. Lord, I pray that you would make clear your call upon their life to be your hands and feet. I pray also that they would not fear the changes that occur, knowing that in an unknown future, that we can live victoriously because we follow a known God, a God who came to us in the person of Jesus, who died on the cross and rose again, that we might know life and we might know it abundantly and we might know it eternally. So, Lord, to you, that God, be all the glory. In Christ's name, amen. Hey, amen. I invite you to stand as we sing this last song together, Goodness of God. Oh, my dear, 
I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful So, so good With every breath that I am made Oh, I will say Of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest nights you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have been in the goodness of God this in your own life but if you're running away from God his goodness is running after you if you veered away from the path that God wants to bless you on he's running after you that's how great his love is for you I pray today that each one of us finds both the goodness and the love of God in our lives. 
Go in peace after you've gone to the fellowship hall and shared snacks. Amen.